Well, with the children, we have been looking at our need for salvation, and we have been reminded from the Bible that there is only one way in and through which we can be saved, or we can know uh, that fellowship and companionship that God has promised in his word to those who uh, believe him. Last time we noted that our sin separates us from God, and we have to work out a way where we can get from sin to salvation and can know that we are having fellowship with God. Well, tonight we're going to look at four children. You can see them all here. And these four children have tried four different ways to get to God. We have uh, over here, first of all, we've got Gail. And Gail has decided that if she goes to church every Sunday, goes to Sunday school, and learns everything she can, that she will be able to build a bridge from her sin over to God. But Gail is about to find out that no matter how hard she can work at going to Sunday school and church, that is never going to be enough to be a bridge across this chasm here. Now, we have another little fellow here, and uh, his name is Trevor. And Trevor has the idea that being born into a Christian home, that means his mum and dad and his brothers and sisters, they all go to church every Sunday. And dad reads from the Bible, and they say their prayers, and they wouldn't eat a meal before they have given grace and asked God to bless the food to them and give God thanks for the food that has been prepared. And Trevor imagines that because he has parents who are Christians, that will help him to get over this chasm and to have fellowship with God. But Trevor's about to discover that no matter how good his parents are, or even his siblings, that it will not get him over from his sin into the place of forgiveness with God. And the Bible is very clear on that. It does explain to us that God doesn't have any grandchildren. God only has children. So we can't depend upon our parents to get us into touch with God. We must go directly, and we must yield our lives to the Lord Jesus. So there we have uh, Justin, who has been uh, thinking that, that by his uh, parents he might even get uh, to church. Here we have uh, another one who thinks that maybe by praying and asking God, to help him and to be with him uh, at school and at play and at home and when he goes to bed at night, uh, that every time he uh, realizes that he needs God, if he prays, then God will answer all his prayers and uh, one day he will go to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus. And then the last one you will notice is that of good works. So he did the best he could to help as many as he could, and uh, he was well thought of, but he also learned that our good deeds, our good works, will never get us to heaven. It's good to do them, but they will never get us to heaven. And the reason why these things will not bridge the gulf or the gap and will not get us to heaven are all centered on one thing. And that is going back to what we learned last Sunday night, 
that there is only one way of salvation. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father. That is, no one can cross over this great gulf or gap except through me. So Jesus is the only way to heaven. And next Sunday night, God willing, we look at what that means and how that can be accomplished. But let's remember that little verse. There is no one the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl will get to heaven apart from having faith in the Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to read a few verses now from Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, we'll read the first nine verses. Hebrews 6, verse 1 through to verse 9. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, Things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Amen. And we know the Lord will confirm once again the blessing of his word to all our hearts. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you for this privilege given to us to gather for these moments around your word. We recognize that you are with us, having promised where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. We know that we do not need to search the heavens to bring you down, nor plumb the depths to bring you up, for you are here. You have promised never to leave us, nor to forsake us. We know that in particular, as we read the scriptures, 
you are very present, for you have given us the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, recognizing that the natural mind cannot understand the things of God. They must be spiritually discerned. We lay our hope once again this evening upon the fulfillment of your promise as we are led, guided into truth. We pray that if there is any confusion in our minds, it will be relieved tonight. If there are those who would think that their salvation is dependent upon their actions or even their faith, we pray that you will expose the error of their thinking. If there are those who perhaps are feeling rather vulnerable in their faith, they have doubts and fears. We pray that you will strengthen them and enable them to lay hold upon your word and rest in your promise and take confidence that their salvation is secure in the Lord Jesus. And so we pray that you will encourage our hearts tonight and as your blessing rests upon us gathered here. Be with those who share in the live stream or in the other broadcasts. And may the word of God go forth freely and may your name be glorified. Bless those with particular burdens tonight. Those who are passing through difficult times. Grant that they will know the God of all comfort coming to their aid in grace and mercy and love and power. We pray in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We um, are not a church that seeks for controversy, but... We are a church that will not falter when it comes to teaching and to preaching the good news of the gospel. Uh, as never before, I sense, as I'm sure many of you do, that we are living in dark and difficult times when the word of Scripture is being conformed to a way of thinking that compromises its truth. And so many are confused as to uh, what the Bible actually teaches. It is always our endeavor to ensure that as we preach, it is not the words of man's wisdom, but rather the display of the passion of the very heart of Christ. It is in power, as the Apostle Paul declared when he went to address the believers in Corinth. Now, that will mean, of course, that we will not uh, evade or avoid delicate or even difficult portions of Scripture. As we systematically engage in the study of God's Word, it means that we have to be disciplined. And as we come to each passage, to each verse, and to each subject, we are compelled to deal with it in the context of its setting. The passage that we are about to explore uh, tonight, and it will only be an introductory comment, is one of those passages of Scripture that confront us and compel us to a more thorough investigation. As on the surface, it would almost appear as though it is a contradiction of other Scriptures. Yet as we 
study the Bible as we engage in an understanding of its truth. One of the first rules of interpretation that are laid upon us by way of discipline is the fact that the Bible does not contradict itself. Now, you say that's difficult to understand, given that we have so many interpretations of so many passages of Scripture. And yet, the Bible warns us that the Bible has not been given to us as a means of private interpretation. It simply means that we dare not, we cannot isolate Scripture in order to suit our own preference. Nor can we avoid Scripture just because it is difficult to insert into the overall teaching of the Word. If there is a dilemma of understanding, it is not with the revelation of Scripture, but rather it is with our interpretation of it. And so tonight we're going to address the theme, no doubt in or out. No doubt in or out. In other words, when we have taken that step of faith and the Holy Spirit conveys to our heart the true message of the gospel. And we are compelled to confess that we are sinners without hope and without God in the world. When we are prepared to acknowledge that there can be only one mediator, one savior, one name in and through, and by which we can be saved, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we acknowledge that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. When we acknowledge that the word is promised, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whenever we confirm in our heart our surrender to him, our acknowledgement that he alone is our Savior, our righteousness, only in him are we accepted by a holy God. Do we then understand, not only with our mind, but with our heart, that we are truly saved by grace, through faith? It is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, having gained that confirmation, that witness of the Holy Spirit, that we are being conformed to the will of God, as we are being confirmed as God's people in our mind and in our heart. We are brought into the conviction, having already been under the conviction. We are now brought into the conviction that we are the people of God. God has not given us the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And that word, Abba, is an Aramaic word, and it is the most tender word that can be found in the biblical language to confer and confirm the relationship, the dear, the precious, the loving relationship of a child and his or her father. 
This conviction is given to those who have surrendered their life to Jesus. We know that we are the children of God. The Bible tells us so. The Spirit reminds us of the promises that God has made. And the outward expression of our lives confirm that we are followers of Jesus. The Bible tells us that we will be changed. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. All things become new. We cannot serve God and mammon or the world. Either we will love one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the life of the believer confirms by their fruit, you shall know them. You say, but the Bible tells us we're not to judge one another, so therefore it's unfair and it's unrighteous for us to look at another and determine in our mind or heart that they cannot be a child of God, or perhaps their faith is limited and uh, they waver in their walk with God simply because they have not fully surrendered or committed their lives to God. There are things, no doubt, that hinder us. In fact, we're warned to put aside every weight on the things that so easily beset us. And the word beset there means trip us up. And we are to put aside those hindrances in our heart and in our life, lest we fall into the snare or the trap that has been laid for us. As uh, we move into these verses in Hebrews chapter 6, we, at the very outset, need to realize that here is our response not only to the teaching of Scripture, but also to the times in which this portion of the Bible has been written. We need to take into consideration those to whom it is written. And the application of this passage must be seen in the light of the whole, not simply in light of the few verses that deal with what appears to be a very controversial uh, portion uh, of the Scriptures. We must uh, begin, as I've indicated, with our study on the basis and on the premise that the Bible will not uh, contradict itself. The Bible works in total harmony. And just as in the Gospels we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John describing various scenes and situations and declare the ministry of Jesus uh, with a, a different slant and from a different position and with a different understanding. So we need to be able to grasp what each passage of the Bible is confirming. And as we bring it into the harmony of Scripture, we very soon discover that the Bible is one book that gives one message. The Bible is a book of history, but it's also a book of his story. And as we look through these references, we keep in mind the fact that what the Bible teaches in other places cannot be threatened by our understanding, limited though it may be, of any given passage of Scripture. And so we approach this theme, this subject, 
and this vital teaching on that basis. Now, in these verses, 4 through to verse 8 in particular, we have one of the set warnings that come to us in this book. If the Lord spares us, keeps us well, healthy, strong, so we can keep coming to church like this, and if he tarries his coming, and we have time to expand our thought on this book of the Bible, we will discover that there are four passages within the book of Hebrews that are classified as warnings. So when we view these verses, that is how we must approach them. This is a warning. Now, we do, of course, need to discover who the warning is for. What is the intention of the writer? Who is he writing to? And what is the purpose of his writing? And what is the outcome desired to be? Well, it doesn't take long before we discover that this is a, a warning that comes on the back of an already stated revelation that begins at the middle part of chapter 5. And we have gone through all of this, and it has to do, you will recall, with those who ought to, by this time, at this stage, they need to be able to eat the meat of the Word but they are still on the bottle. They are still drinking the milk of the Word. They cannot digest the deeper things of God. Now, this is a situation that cannot continue. For lack of proper nourishment, will lead to a deficiency in the diet that will ultimately create medical problems, among which will be deformities and other such weaknesses that expose the body to disease and to death. There is nothing so tragic as witnessing an unhealthy church. Now, if you want to see what a, an unhealthy church is like, just reread the first book of Corinthians. And as you read through Corinthians, you learn what it is like to be a weak, malnourished church. Now, this is the contention that the writer to the Hebrews is addressing. He cannot let this situation go any further. The first chapters of the book have been concentrating and focusing on what we discover as we go through the book has been the problem all along. They have been devoutly religious. And now that they are exposed to a life of faith, they're not quite ready to embrace it. The reason being, they're not quite sure if their faith can overcome their conscience, a conscience that has been nurtured under the law. That's why you'll find in the first chapters of Hebrews the comparison between the teachings of Judaism and the presentation of the gospel that centers in the Lord Jesus. 
It's a little bit like someone from an orthodox faith who embraces Christianity and it becomes something that they've been drawn to, attracted to, and their heart compels them to believe in the Lord Jesus. But they still need to pray to Mary. They still need to confess their sin to a priest. They still need to partake of the Eucharist, fearing that if they refuse or if they do not, that they are not receiving grace in the sacrament that brings them salvation, so that their religion becomes a synchronism between their traditional views and their newfound faith. And holding on to their religion, they are forfeiting the need to grow and to become more dependent upon the things of God. Now, as we go through the book of Hebrews, these warnings will become more clearly identified and seen because we will be moving from the outward connections with the priesthood. So far, we have looked at Christ being superior over angels, superior over the high priests, and so on. But as we move further into Hebrews, we will begin to see how Jesus is presented as being greater than the very things that lie at the heart of the Judaistic beliefs, and that is the sacrifice the altar of worship where animals are sacrificed, blood is shed, and uh, the foretelling of the coming of Messiah is clearly defined. But at this point, we haven't quite got to the heart of the message of the gospel. For the lamb upon the Old Testament altar was meant to be a type a symbol, a ritual, to indicate that another would come. And you remember how John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the early disciples and the crowd who had gathered uh, for baptism. Remember John the Baptist declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A statement that we relish and understand perfectly today, but to the Jew of Jesus' day, salvation was of the Jews. The Gentiles had no part in it. And therefore, to be told, that Jesus would take away the sin of the world, that is, Jew and Gentile, was an alien feature of this new faith, this new teaching, this new religion. Hence, the antagonism, the anger, the frustration that slowly built until at last they are crying out, take him away, crucify him. We will not have this man to rule over us. So now the writer to the Hebrews is uh, compelling us to commit to this understanding. If we are a child of God, genuinely, born again of the Spirit of God, two things will happen. The two marks of a believer. One, we will know it because we will feel it. It's not an outward 
conformity to a platform or program of worship. It is, in reality, the confession of a relationship where we have submitted our hearts and lives to Jesus. So the first sign, if we are truly the children of God, then we will feel it. The second sign, if we are truly the children of God, the world will see it. The world will see it. You cannot be a Christian. You cannot be a child of God and not be seen to be different. The issue is, if we are changed, we are different. If we are different, we will be seen to be different. How many of our work colleagues know that we are the people of God? When we go to school or to college or university, how many of our fellow students really know that we are Christians? Do they have to be told? Do we have to do something to show or to indicate that we are Christians? Or is it that we have been given a, an upbringing that has stretched our commitment to a church or denomination, to a creed, to our religious culture. And somehow we are driven by a conscience that is anchored in the works of the flesh or the teaching of the church. Or are we motivated, are we driven by the compulsion of the laws of God which are written not on tables or tablets of stone, but the fleshly tables of the heart. The question before us is, how are you in your walk with God? How genuine is your faith and your conviction? For now the writer is about to lay upon us this challenge. If you are weak in your faith, if you are not anchored in Christ within the veil, if you are not being kept by the power of God in this evil world, if you are not feeding, feasting upon the meat of the Word, the truths of Scripture, if you are not being built up in your faith, grounded and settled, if you are not becoming more and more conformed to the likeness or the image of Christ, could it be that the seed that has fallen upon your heart has not gone any deeper than the roots of the briar or the weed that are not only entitled to, but determined to kill the seed that has been so, there are many who have made a profession of faith, but they know nothing about the possession of Christ. You can be a professor without being a possessor. And at the end of the day, it's not what we claim to be. It's not what we testify to be. It's what we are that matters. Now let's read how this uh, warning begins. 
This we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. So what is it that we are questioning about the will of God? This we will do if God permits. What will we do? Well, in the context of the passage, it's a move towards growth and maturity. This we will do if God permits. Now, isn't that an interesting way to introduce this warning? Could we not simply say, well, surely God would permit anyone who wants to grow to grow. Does that not go without saying? Would it not be wrong of us to say that God doesn't want everybody to really grow strong and mature even though they're a believer. He wants to have some weak believers scattered in amongst the strong ones so that the weak ones can learn to lean on the strong ones and the strong ones can l learn how to lift up the feeble knees of those that are weak. Would that not be a fair assumption? Well, it probably would if we didn't read our Bibles too often. But you will never find any reference in Scripture to the will of God desiring that any believer be limited in their knowledge of him or in their service for him or in the expanding of their relationship with him. Not one. The entire Scripture is built around this concept of learning more and more how to walk closer and closer with God and how to avoid the pitfalls of mediocrity that would apply an apathy to our minds that would prevent us from wanting to grow as the people of God. Now we know that there are so many things that happen to us in our lives that make it difficult for us to go to the places and the things that we should be going to, like prayer meetings and Bible studies and church and, and fellowship evenings and so on. Um, and we can't be at everything. But the point is, that God in his will and purpose for his people has set out for us everything that we need in terms of life and godliness. Peter stresses this. God has given us everything that we need to help us live and to be godly. In fact, and again Peter tells us, that he has given us great and precious promises by which we have been made partakers of the very nature of Christ. You see, if we are not growing in our Christian lives, it is not because God wills it to be that way. It is rather because we are not taking advantage of every benefit and every blessing that God has set out for us carefully in his word. And if we're not growing, then we are simply fading away. Now, this is the concern of the writer here. And let's... Uh, Let's read from verse 4 through to verse 8 once again. For it is impossible, note the word for. So here is the continuation. Here is the explanation. Here is the illustration. So now verse 4 through to verse 8 becomes the application, if you like, of that third verse. God wants us to grow, but if there is no confirmation, no possibility 
that we can grow, then God is determined to separate the wheat from the tares. That is exactly the position that is being related to us here. Now note, this is very much a hands-off kind of warning. It's not up to you or me to look around and say, well, I don't think that person's really saved. Or I don't think that that person has really got the truth. We do not see into the heart. We look in the outward. God sees the heart. God is working in the field that he has planned to tend. But here is the reality. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Just note in that, uh, that sixth verse, there will never, ever be another Calvary. There will never, ever be another sacrifice of Jesus. It is a once and for all, that is for all time, sacrifice for sin. But you and I can put Christ on the cross again. And note how that can happen. We put him to an open shame. What is it that shames the church? What is it that shames the Bible? What is it that shames the things of God, that shames the people of God? What is it? It is someone who professes to be a Christian, but their life is not aligned to the teaching of the Bible. The Bible has a word for it, and it's the word hypocrite. Now, this is the concept that will be developed in these verses. But in order to grasp this and to hold on to this and to be encouraged by this verse, we do need to know what the Bible means when it speaks of those who were once enlightened, when it speaks of those who have tasted the heavenly gift when it refers to those who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, surely these are terms that are explaining and exploring the possibilities of a true child of God. How then can they relate to someone who is a, a phony, a fake, someone who is a Hypocrite. Well, time is gone. That was supposed to be the sermon tonight. But we'll come back to this, God willing, next Sunday night, and we'll look at these references just to confirm that verse 4 and 5 is not referencing a true born-again child of God but rather one who has made a feeble attempt to represent in the flesh the things of God. So they will not, in essence, lose their salvation because you cannot lose what you have never had. 
And the confirming word is that if we are truly the people of God, then we will never lose what God has graciously given to us. Let's bow for prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you tonight for your word and its challenge to our hearts. We pray that our eyes will be open, our heart will be open, and our will will submit to the will of God so that we will not be as professors only but possessors of the truth. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.